So let's pray as we get into the word, man. Father, thank you, Lord, again. As Jeremy was just even praying now, we thank you, Lord, for your presence. We ask, Lord, that you would fill us with your Holy Spirit now. Give us ears to hear your word, Lord, in regards to our lives. As we sit here, Lord, and just kind of walk in this life, uh, knowing the light and the truth, uh, because of what you did. You, you woke us up out of our sleep. Lord, you, you brought us to a place of understanding. And so, Lord, we pray for that wisdom tonight that we would hear from you and that we would leave here uh, closer to you. So, Lord, even in the scriptures that we read, we pray that they would come alive, as your word says in Hebrews, that your word is living. So, Lord, I just pray that you'd clear our minds and that we would be focused on what the context, what your scripture teaches, Lord, tonight, that we would hear from you. Encourage us, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Genesis chapter 6. Um, kind of been a, an interesting reading so far. I always say that, but because it always is, uh, in regards to the leading up to this moment of Genesis. We're approaching a time when a decision was made in the heavens before God and his heavenly council. Approaching a time where things changed for mankind. You know, remember, he had a beginning. That was the Garden of Eden, paradise, with Adam and Eve. God had a plan. He had a thing that he wanted to see come about. And then we read, all of us together, how that plan was thwarted and changed a little bit because of sin. And then we were able to see... Cain and go off and, well, not only did he kill his brother, but go off and try to live a life, you know, and what that meant to be separated from God. And then we've seen the Lord provide for Adam and Eve a son named Seth, and which established a different line of blood, so to speak, because the line of Cain was essentially just cursed, um, separated from God. You know, but then you get to a point in reading Genesis and say, well, you know, what, what's going to happen next? How, how, how much further can this go? What, when does God finally kind of take a step back and watch and look down and say, oh man, what's going on with the plan that I had for these people and their lives? Tonight's message is one of those that I think happens in every one of our lives, where eventually God looks down in our lives and says, well, what's going on in your life? What's happening down there? What, how are you doing? Uh, how, how, what kinds of decisions have you made? You know, when we looked at the, the genealogy of Cain or the line of Cain, you got all that symbolism behind it of what it meant to the names behind the kids that he was having, even with, with the line of Seth. And, and now we're going to see like the, the sort of the building up of all of this tonight. And then we're going to watch God set forth a plan. And, you know, we have to read this with several different ears. I mean, you know, we got two ears, but we're going to have to read it and listen to them with six ears, man, because this, this is going to go to level 50, you know what I mean? As far as what it means for our lives individually, what it means for their lives as we're reading the scripture, and then what it means in the, the scope of what Jesus taught. Because, you know, the scripture is comp com complicated like that. It speaks on all kinds of different levels. And the only way I've ever found to really hear from the Lord is to read it as for what it says <laughs> in context, verse by verse. And that's what we do. So I want to start off by reading a scripture in Matthew chapter 24. And it's verse 37. Uh, and you can write it down. You can turn there and follow along with me. Uh, and I, I want to start off with this scripture because it's sort of like the end theme of what we're going to talk about tonight. But I, I like to throw these things at the beginning sometimes so that way our minds are stayed on some of the stuff I think what's really supposed to be directed here in our context. So in Matthew chapter 24, verse 37, this is Jesus speaking now, okay? So we are just fast forwarded all the way in time and now we're going to our Savior while he was walking the earth. And this is what he said. But as the days of Noah, 
just as some of your translations might say, just as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. So Jesus is saying, we have to look at the days of Noah. And what are we reading about tonight in our scripture? The days of Noah. Jesus is saying there, he's turning the, the attention of the believers to the days of Noah. And he's saying, just as those days were, so is going to be the coming of the Son of Man. What is the coming of the Son of Man? Well, his return for his church. You and I. The rapture. Okay? He's saying, just as the days of Noah is going to be those day, these days too. But notice, for as in the days that were before the flood, meaning the scripture we're going to get into tonight, they were eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark. So he's basically telling the reader and his audience at that time, well, just in the days of Noah, everything was as is, business as usual. People were just having a blast, eating and drinking, kind of living life, marrying, just doing, just doing life. He says, and knew, verse 39, not until the flood came and took them all away, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Interesting. He's saying, so the same way that those people got caught off guard and swept away in the flood because they weren't paying any attention to godliness or righteousness, well, so is the same way it's going to be done in the last days when I return. And notice he gives a little parable in which we are all so familiar with. Then shall two be in the field, the one shall be taken, and the other left. Two women shall be grinding at the mill, the one shall be taken, and the other left. And then look at verse 42. He says, watch therefore, for ye know not what your hour your Lord doth come. So he's telling the readers here and his audience and us, in these days that you and I are living in, these are the days of the Son of Man. And he's saying, life is going to go on as usual. People are going to be about their business. People are going to be talking about the rapture. Oh, the Lord's going to come back. Just as Noah was like, hey, I got an ark over here, building an, a boat in a place that has never seen rain. And we are talking of a thing, of a, of a Savior returning in the sky to take home his people and snatch them up in what we define as the rapture. He's saying, these days that we're living in today are going to be the exact same as the days of Noah. So let's turn there and find out in detail what exactly he means. This is interesting. And I'm going to give you guys some, 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 <laughs> I've studied this chapter for years. And I don't even know how I'm going to teach it right now. So we just need to pray for that. <laughs> I, I, I just, I'm so excited right now to teach like a kid. And I'm like, what am I going to say? Because it's just so many things. And watch it just come out so weird. So pray for me. And verse 1, chapter 6. And it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, daughters were born unto them. So simple reading in that. Time has gone by. The line of Cain has, has continued to birth people. The line of Seth has continued to birth people. So the earth, in other words, is multiplying. Some people say that the earth at this point multiplied to billions of people. It gives the example of all those years that we read in the, the past chapter of people living to be 900 something years old. Can you imagine how many kids come out after living 900 something years old? So it talks about billions are multiplying the earth at this time. And remember one thing, guys, interesting about this scripture is we're talking about today we have what, you know, Billions of people on our earth today. Oh, but we live all throughout the whole earth. This is confined to one area of the earth. Okay, and what some people believe was a supercontinent or whatever. But the fact of the matter is, is it's defined to one section of the earth. People aren't spread apart like we are today. So we're talking about billions of people occupying one environment. What happens when you put billions of people in one room? And so the, the scripture here is a simple read. Oh, multiplying the face of the earth. No, we're talking about Ants and ants and ants and ants and, and, and bugs upon bugs of people occupying one space. And what happens when you put so many people in one space in one room? They've done studies on that. They've actually shoved and crammed people in rooms. Weird stuff starts to happen. So the earth, the picture that we have tonight about our earth we're going to read is an earth that is so populated with two gr groups of people that exist. One is the line of Cain. The other is the line of Seth. 
You know, it's very sad and confusing sometimes when you see righteousness and unrighteousness together. The Bible tells us and teaches us out of the church of the last days, there's going to be two people groups that operate together under the same roof. And those two people groups are called the wheat and the tares. And what we know of the wheat is that's supposed to be, well, the good gardener planted good seeds and the wheat grew. But then somebody during the night while he was asleep came in and planted bad seeds and those things took root as well. And when he woke up the next day, this is Jesus telling a parable, both were together. And he goes, oh, man, look, at there's tares among the wheat. But then eventually, as the people were saying, well, rip out the bad ones, his response was, well, I can't. I can't rip out the bad ones because if I rip out the bad ones amongst the good ones, I'm going to damage some root. So I got to leave them there. And today we find ourselves in that garden of wheat and tares. We are living among, you know, turn to the brother next to you and do one of those kind of things. We are living among some who are considered to be the tares. And I'm not, you know, take that for however you want. Righteousness and unrighteousness together in one room. Wheat and tares together in one garden. It only means one thing. And God, in his wisdom, in his divine majesty, says, I'm going to leave it until the day I come back. And as and a matter of fact, the parable that Jesus gave, he says, well, there will be a time where the tares will be ripped out, but it's when they're going to be ripped out and burned and cast into the fire. So we get to look forward to living among some people who aren't like-minded as us. So the world is multiplying here. And it now says, verse 2, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair. And they took them wives of all which they chose. Now we run across a deep theological argument. The sons of God, who are these? The daughters of men, who are they? Now I'm going to try my best to just bring down the two parties that exist here in this scripture reading. The sons of God, some say, are angels. A supportive verse would be found in Job chapter 1, verse 6, that says, Now there was a day when the sons of God, quote, okay, unquote, end quote, came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. This is Job explaining to us that one day Satan went to go accuse the brethren and the angels who considered in that verse to be the sons of God came with them. So supporters and readers will say, well, you see, those are angels. Clearly, the Bible says it in context. The sons of God are angels because we know that they went with Satan before God to accuse the brethren. But others would turn to a scripture like Matthew chapter 22, verse 30, and they would say, well, Jesus said that for in the resurrection... They neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels of God in heaven. Meaning, the angels of God in heaven can't marry or be given in marriage. So the other, part of the, the other party will say, well, you see there, so they can't be angels. Because right here it clearly says that they took wives for themselves. Greek mythology loves our chapter tonight. And, though, and ancient alien theorists love it too. Uh, you guys watch Ancient Aliens, right? After I've mentioned it so many times, I'm sure we're all just hooked on it. Ancient Aliens, okay? They, they, they love this chapter, okay? Because this is a chapter that explains to them this unholy matrimony of divine beings and humanity. They love it. Sons of God, angels, unholy matrimony, intercourse with human beings. You see, they're divine. They're like the Greek, Greek gods. Half man, half God. It says it clearly here. Others would say, you know, this is getting weird. You know, half men, angels, you know, having intercourse with women. How on earth can that even happen? I used to listen to a teacher. uh, uh, What's his name? I'm almost forgetting it. Maybe because the Lord doesn't want me to say it out loud. No, uh, he's the guy who, uh, real radical teacher. Uh, You guys know him. Chuck. Yeah, Mr. Yeah, I heard that brother teach this chapter, blew my mind. Now, he takes it to another level. Jesus said, just as the days of Noah, so our days are going to be today. So where do where, where we see angels, you know, getting, getting together with ladies here? Well, some people take it further stretch and say, well, you see, 
just as the days of Noah were when the angels were having intercourse with women, well, so it's going to be in our last days where guys are going to be demon-possessed and then they're going to be getting together with women and they're going to be producing offspring. That's pretty weird. Missler says it's clones. What's going to happen is they're going to start cloning people. That's what's going to happen. And they're going to clone people and they're going to be this unholy offspring of something that should have never happened from the beginning. I mean, this scripture, guys, could get real weird. Okay, and as we continue to read, it's good. you're going to see why it can get real weird. I'm giving you guys all the different perspectives. That way you can walk out here and choose one for yourself. Or maybe in your group time, argue about which one you think it is. Sons of God and the daughters of men. Some people will say that the sons of God are actually the line of Seth. And the daughters of men, I'm sorry, the sons of God were the line of Cain. And the da- I'm sorry, I got it backwards. Sons of God would be the line of Seth, and the daughters of men would be the line of Cain. Meaning, you have now this unrighteous connection. Those who were of the bloodline that were cursed, and those who were of a bloodline that is blessed. But see, that doesn't quite explain what happens next. If it was just men and women from different bloodline, cursed and uncursed, it doesn't explain why then the next verses are there. So it kind of leads us to believe that there is some kind of, and Chuck Smith taught that there was some kind of spiritual sort of intervention on the demonic realm and the demonic side of things that caused these people to be either possessed by demons or the fallen angels and by that genetically changed the code of humanity. So... But notice, no matter who they are, what they are, how gnarly and alien it is, they thought these women looked good. So they took wives for themselves. And now we're going to kind of get in here because this was a very serious, serious thing that happened here to God. So he says, and the Lord said, verse 3, my spirit shall not always strive with man. God now sitting on the throne watching down on the earth, seeing these, this unholy matrimony, these things taking place that aren't supposed to be, says, you know what? My spirit is not going to always abide with these men. God initiates a plan. He begins to look on the earth and say there's something that has to be done about what's taking place down there. And, you know, without getting kind of, I'll continue to go on the context for a minute, but kind of stepping aside of that and just looking at it from the, as a reader and stepping back, I really, really love that about the Lord, that he looks down on situations that are completely complicated, completely bizarre, completely gnarly to every degree, and he says, I got to set forth the plan. But the one takeaway we can grab real easy with this one is, you know what? God's spirit will not abide with wickedness. And that's a takeaway right off the top. You know, we don't have to dig deep into the, into the alien theory to get that. Wickedness, confusion, God's spirit cannot abide with it. And for us as men living in our last days and our times today, that's not hard to find. Just, and always keep this as a theme as we're reading. Just as of days of Noah, so shall it be in the last days when the Son of Man shall return. And we need to know this much. Confusion and wickedness doesn't blend with God's spirit. And unfortunately, sometimes we take a look around. Oh, actually, you don't have to go too far. You can just turn your TV on. And all you see is nothing but confusion and wickedness. And so it's a little bit of an encouragement because I have to say, if God's saying my spirit doesn't strive with that, but Jesus said, well, when that begins to happen, then the Son of Man returns, I can only say, well, he's only coming a lot more sooner every time I turn the TV on. I go, wow, (laughs) Just looking at confusion and wickedness the way it is today, I can honestly sit here and say that means the Lord's coming back a lot sooner than I thought. And hopefully a lot sooner than we all think. His spirit doesn't abide. It doesn't strive with man. He makes a decision that says, I, can't, I cannot be operating under this. So for that, he also is flesh. And then he numbers the days. Yet his days shall be 120 years. So he sets forth a plan called Operation Destroy the World. (laughs) Okay, in 120 years. Now, verse 4, going back to the whole gnarly ancient alien thing. 
There were giants in the earth in those days. Well, that word is Nephilim. A lot of us know that word Nephilim. We've heard it before. We've heard it taught. Maybe we've heard it taught many times. Also after that, when the sons of God, he goes back to that scenario we were talking, that unholy matrimony, came into the daughters of men, they bare children to them. The same became mighty men which were of old, men of renown. So here is the offspring of this unholy matrimony. The, what was birthed from it. See, what was birthed from the two, from the intercourse of the two, was these giants, these Nephilim, okay, that were mighty, as a matter of fact, causing problems, by the way, as we're going to see. People, these were rulers, and then I've heard it. I've heard these theorists talk about this verse and say, you see, aliens were here. They were controlling the earth. They had rule and reign over different divisions of the earth. They separated it like, you know, as aliens usually do, very intellectually. And they controlled it by these mighty men, which were offspring from divine beings. Which, of course, they translate divine beings to be other aliens. <laughs> and I love that, man. I'd listen to that and go, man, these guys are on. But I know, it's just nuts. These guys are psycho. I love hearing it. Because it's just interesting to think that, you know what? As strange as this sounds, there is some kind of explanation to thinking, well, how would a natural being birth a giant, a, a change in genetics? Unless, of course, demons did possess these men. Unless, of course, they were angels themselves or demons themselves. And then you got to get into how that can happen, which can drive you nuts. But either way, no matter which way we see this happening, this connection that's being made between the sons of God and the daughters of men is birthing forth these rulers, mighty men. Now, some people say Nephilim doesn't quite mean giant. Again, two sides of the scholar, two sides of the theology here. Some people say Nephilim means just something, uh, uh, not a giant in a sense of stature, but a giant in a sense of of being a person who is a, a giant figure. You've heard it said, you know, man, that dude's a giant when it comes to, or that guy's, you know, you can make these comments of somebody being in size, but you're really just talking about their nature. And so some people have said, well, this word Nephilim doesn't necessarily define giants. But then you get into the problems where like Numbers chapter 13, verse 32, that says, when the men went to go spy out the land, it says, and they brought an evil report of the land which they had searched unto the children of Israel, saying the land that we've gone to search is inhabited thereof, uh, and all the people that we saw in there are great stature. In other words, they're giants. And they, were, they saw the giants, the sons of the Anak, which come of, out of the giants. So, you know, the Bible does teach about giants as much as that sounds bizarre. David fought Goliath, six-fingered, six-toed guy. Um, and I guess that just was cool back then because no one, you know, everybody was like, oh, it's one of the giants. So you see, there was a population that existed on the earth in the scripture that are a population that are different than humans like you and I. And the Israelites actually define them as saying, we are literally like grasshoppers in their sight. Those dudes will squash us. And the grapes they have are like as big as our head because they're big. They're people that are large. And so now we have here in our beginning, we have the offspring of an unholy matrimony that are powerful, powerful beings. Controlling the earth. I love this stuff, man. Crazy. Then God's going, wait a second. Something's not right down there. <laughs> because this, this mixture of whatever you want to call them. Whatever we call them, the bottom line is we can know this much. It's a mixture of unholy and holy. We can kind of take that away. Whether you want to call it a giant or, or I mean, a demon-possessed person. Or you want to call it an actual angel. Whatever you want to call it. The fact of the matter is the context is teaching us that there's something happening of a mixture of the two that's birthing forth something not right. As I think, consequently, that would usually do. We're told in our time that we can't be unequally yoked. Well, what does that mean? Well, simple. First of all, you as a believer are not to be unequally yoked with a non-believer. 
And we've heard it taught in our time today that that means everything from marriage, relationships, to business, to everything else. Having ourselves mixed together with the things of the world, holiness and unholiness, births forth something not good. And now I'm not saying, you know, you're going to have some giant as a kid if you're messing around out there. But the fact of the matter is, is we know that it's going to be producing for something that God, does, God doesn't find to be pleasing. And if you wanted to be the person that says, I'm just going to take the Nephilim word to define not someone great in stature, but maybe something just large and something big and, and, you know, in mindset. Well, then you can see that when things are unholy and they're mixed together, it does create big problems. How about that? <laughs> I could take that away. Big problems come from unequally yoked situations. Big problems. Things that God looks down and says, I don't like that for you at all. Man, from the very beginning of the time, we see this, this contrast. These two things colliding. What is, when is man going to learn that we cannot mingle with the two things? I cannot be a Christian. I cannot be lukewarm as much as I really want to be. I'd rather be lukewarm, man. I don't want to stand out like too much where people like start saying, oh, would you pray for me? And then at the same time, I don't want to stand out too much where people just think, man, that guy's foul. So I'm good at just being right in the middle. No, 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 no. What does the Bible teach us about that, guys? You be lukewarm. Jesus said it when he was talking about seven churches, Laodicea. He said, as if you're lukewarm. And Laodicea, by the way, is an actual city that existed. And the reason why he used Laodicea as an example of what lukewarm was, because Laodicea was far enough from cold waters of spring water that would provide for the city cold water. And, and so it was far enough to, by the time the water got to their springs and the areas that they would drink from, it was lukewarm. And it was just, just not happy. And if you've gone on mission trips, and some of you have gone with me, and if you ever want to go to places I go, you drink lukewarm water, you kind of go, oh, this is not good at all. This is gross, man. I want cold ice water. And he's saying to be lukewarm is not going to fly. I'd rather you hot, I'd rather you cold, is what he's saying. I'd rather you hot, I'd rather you on the other side, one or the other side. Jesus said it. You cannot serve two masters. You either serve the one or serve the other, period. Well, that's kind of legalistic. Yeah, it is. You know what? There it is. Swallow it. You can't be serving the, the world or the things of it. And, or, or you got to serve the Lord. Which one are we doing? And from the very beginning of time, we see a disgust happen in the perspective of God over two, a union of two things that do not belong together. And in our, in our context, it's producing for giants that are basically controlling the world now at this point. So yeah, just as the days of Noah, so shall it be, and the return of the Son of Man. What does that mean? Well, does that mean that when he comes back, we're going to see a lot of lukewarm people? That, does he, that, yeah, maybe giants? <laughs> well, and that's where Chuck Missler says, yeah, the giants really are the clones. They're going to, in other words, he said, he said that these are spiritless men. If an angel is having intercourse with a woman, then it's not being birthed with a spirit like you and I have. So whatever's happening, these things are being birthed forth spiritless. So then he goes on to say, well, that's what a clone would be. If you cloned a person, it doesn't, it's not birthed with the spirit of God. It's birthed by the hands of men. So these Nephilim or giants that we will see in the last days will be something as similar to what a spiritless being would be, you know, and that's a clone. That's Hint Missler. Now, now that, I'm, not, I don't even, I'm just sharing it with you guys. Okay, I'm not teaching it for gospel truth. I'm just sharing it with you. But the concept of it is the same, meaning what, what does this mean in these last days that we are going to see among us? So is it that we're going to see some gnarly beings? I don't know. My father-in-law thinks they're coming back, and that's unfortunate. i got to pray for him. You know, he, he tells me the other day, oh, Phil, they're going to visit the United States first. I go, oh, really? Man, well, that'll be interesting. You know, right on. Go USA. I kind of told him, like. What else am I going to say, man? But people are looking. They're looking for this weird interaction with some half-human, half-divine being. So now God says in verse 5, He saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination 
of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Every imagination. Again, you shove enough people in one room, guess what's going to happen? So what does that do, you know? <laughs> How does that work? What if we did this? What if we did that? See, the world was so heavily populated with a mixture of now sin in the most disgust way. You put enough people, all sm smash them all in one room or one elevator, somebody's going to be killing somebody by the end of the day. Or doing something weird. See, I love this verse because it talks about the imagination of the thoughts. I would hope that we're all able, past that point, where we can all admit that our minds are perverse. And that our minds think nothing but evil. Unless you're looking at me like, not me, bro. Speak for yourself, Pastor Phil. All right, sorry. <laughs> but if you're a man in this room, you got me sideways. If you don't think, I don't think you're, you can be perverted at times. Okay? Or if you can't, if you start to realize that your mind. Well, you know what? Let's leave it for the Bible to say. <laughs> I don't need to say it. See, what happens with man after life continues to go on with wickedness among it, and men begin to decide that they're okay with living a mixed life, both with a little bit of this and a little bit of that included, I guarantee you the thoughts on your mind and the imagination of your mind is wickedness. Well, what is wickedness? Well, wickedness is a lot of things. Wickedness are things that separate you from God. So wickedness can even mean yourself. I'm not talking about people, you know, uh, burning crosses or, uh, on your back or, or standing upside down and bleeding. I'm not talking about weird wickedness stuff. I'm talking about wickedness is simply things that separate you from God. And sometimes that's just pride. Sometimes that's just egotistical things. Sometimes that's just that's finances. That's wickedness. Anything that's going to separate you from God, that's a result of lukewarm lifestyle. And after all this comes about, God begins to look in the minds. You guys remember that scripture when he talks, uh, he takes the, uh, Ezekiel into the minds of the priest. You remember that? He grabbed him by the hair and he took him to a little hole in the wall. And he showed him the minds of the, of the men, the priest, the godly men, the Christians, the believers. And you know what he, he saw when he entered into the room of the hole that was in the wall? And he went in, he looked around the walls, and he saw nothing but perversion written on the walls of the minds of the priests. Images, pictures, things that were discussed, things that were to never be found in the minds of the priest, things that were never to be found in those that represented the church of God, you and I. We need to ask ourselves, Lord, purify my mind, first of all. Forgive me of my sin. <laughs> and we need to be careful that we don't walk on a road that begins to allow the imagination of our thoughts to become as it was in those priests, as it was in those believers. Because we're very similar to them. We're only men. And look at, he says that it was continually, that they were just thinking nothing but evil continually. Sometimes I listen to the new movements that we're surrounded by in our world today, and I think, are you serious? I hear and we hear together uh, in our time of the different uh, movements we have in our world, the different groups that we see that are gaining a lot of pub publicity, different politicians we might hear that are pushing for certain agendas. And I say, are you seriously just sitting around thinking about evil? Because I don't, I don't have any idea how our world has come to a point today where we can sit there and listen to a speech or watch a movement of some sort that is completely opposite of what would be even halfway moral. And yet you got so many people that are just for it and support it. And it blows me away. For some of you guys who've been around a little bit longer in this room, you guys have seen this country go from, you know, from one side to the next. I mean, how, how, how is that? I mean, some of you guys have, who lived through it, Dennis, some of you guys have lived through some of this stuff, man. Some historical things, things that are written down, books. <laughs> Point being, though, you know, I'm kidding, man. I love Dennis, my brother. Good, but some of you guys know what I'm talking about. You've watched the world and our nation flip upside down. And, and we sit there and go, this is seriously nothing but wickedness. How can I see that? How can all of these, what we would call, you know, educated and brilliant minds not see that this is completely immoral? But, hey. 
That's what happens when you pack them all in like sardines. And you start to just let them think for a while. And when they start to do and begin to incorporate the two concepts of good and wrong. See, and that's what's happening today. Jesus said it. Just in my days when I return, that's how it's going to be in your days. And guess what, guys? We're seeing it happen today. We are seeing an unholy matrimony of righteousness and unrighteousness together, birthing forth wickedness. We are seeing that today. And we are seeing these giants, so to speak, on TV, just with so many people behind them, preaching nothing but nonsense, and people following them. They have power that I don't understand where they get it from. I don't understand how they're influential at all. It's like my kids can get that they're whacked out. But you see a certain power that exists behind people that's able to move entire, an entire nation. Inspired by wickedness. Because they're incorporating what we want to call good and evil. Well, you'll hear one part of it that says good. And the other part of it is completely evil. And everybody cheers and shouts. And everybody goes, yeah, that's what we want to do. And we as Christians sit back and go, what on earth is happening right before our very eyes? What's going to be when my kids are older, for crying out loud? So now, because of that, verse 6, it repented the Lord that he had made man on earth. Wow. What? (laughs) It repented the Lord that he had made man on earth. It grieved him in his heart. Now, these are some terms here that you're going to take a while to process and chew on. You know, does God have a heart? Probably not. He's not human, but, you know, he's divine. But the symbolism behind it, we can all relate and understand what it is to be hurt, what it is to go through pain, what it is to go through grief. And the symbolism mentioned in this verse is for us to be able to identify what God's perspective on what was happening with the earth thus causes us to understand why then God would do what he's about to do to the earth. There's a certain hurt that comes along with God's decision. A certain grieving. We can't anger God. He doesn't get angry. He doesn't get angry. So if you just, if we're one of those, one of those guys, I know I got God so mad, bro. He's probably so mad at me. Well, that's just the enemy lying to you, trying to convict you. But you see, by our actions and decisions, as we see here in our scripture, we can certainly grieve the Lord. Grieve His Holy Spirit. And the New Testament teaches us that very clearly. See, by our actions and the things that we do, when we ourselves try to create an unholy matrimony with the world, you are a walking light, you are righteousness, and you try to step into the unrighteousness, it begins to birth forth decision makings that grieve God's Spirit grieves him doesn't anger him oh man god's gonna squash me no see it grieves him when we choose to make a decision that we know oh man you know i knew i shouldn't have done that man i knew i was getting into this and i probably should have been careful with that you don't know god's not going to be mad at you i know i got the old man upstairs you know teed off no you didn't you didn't you grieved him sin in the believer's life, grieves God's heart. It, it's the part of grace and mercy that he says, I'm going to forgive you, of course. And we got to be careful with that even. Because some of us are so confident in his forgiveness that it allows us to make decisions willfully and trespass into sin. Because he's merciful. But I don't want to grieve the Lord. My sons, I, geez, man, you know. Many of you guys have realized this and learned it. You know, you, when your kids grieve you, they grieve you. You don't get mad at them. And well, you're, sure, maybe for a moment, because we're flesh, we might. But mostly when you're grieved by your kids, you don't want to go and run them over with a car. <laughs> you know, maybe you might think that for a moment. But you go, you know, I, I love my children so much. And I care so much about them. And I want nothing but the best for them in this life that it hurts when they begin to make decisions that are not right. And as a father, and, and even as some of us who are sons to our mothers and fathers, we've seen them grieved by decisions we have made. And it's pain. It's a deep pain. One that almost even sometimes extends love further. 
The more you're grieved over your kids, the more you want to extend grace to them because you just want to, you just go, gosh, I'm, I'm so hurt by what they're doing. I really want to bring them close to me and love them even more. And God, being the ultimate example of a father, being the ultimate example of love, shows us next what it is to truly love someone. So he says in verse 7, And the Lord said, I will destroy man. I'm going to destroy him. Whom I have created from the face of the earth. Both man and beast and creeping thing and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. He summed up Genesis chapter 1 all in one sentence right now. Everything I created, I'm going to destroy it now. You're talking about pain so deep, a grief, a hurt so deep that drives a father to a place of knowing the only way to fix it is to destroy it. Gosh. You know, it's interesting how sometimes for some of you in here who have experienced this, the hardest thing to ever do is to let go. The hardest thing to ever do is to let go of someone you love. I mean, on so many levels. And I don't just mean in loss. I mean even when they're still alive. I mean, a love that is so deep in our hearts for somebody who we see living a life of wickedness, to actually look at your wife and say, I have to let you go and do what you're doing. I don't have a choice. I can't control you. To look at your kids and go, I have to let them go, hon. We have to let them go. We have to watch them. <laughs> we have to just sever the ties. God, you know. And here we see God making a decision as such of saying, I have to sever the tie. I have to let it go. You know, I know a lot of guys who have had to watch their wives go and live lives of immorality right in front of them. Kids, I mean, this is, this is where we're at today. <laughs> I'm just being kind of straight up for a moment. And it grieves men. You don't know what to do anymore. You feel lost. <laughs> but you're experiencing and you're feeling what our God has felt when he looked at the world go backwards and sideways and upside down. And we're experiencing, and you have experienced, maybe some of us in this room, of what God's looking at our nation today and our world that we live in today. Heavy stuff. And he says, and just as the days of Noah, so shall it be when the day of the Son of Man returning. Today, guys, we are going to watch our, we are watching, we are living in a time when our Lord is looking upon this earth and he's grieving. And we are in it. <laughs> we live there. We're here now. And then we have to sometimes ask ourselves, what are we doing? Participating with the world? Or are we participating with God in his grief? Are we looking at the world and saying, I'm going to join it in its philosophies? Are we looking at the scripture and saying, Lord, I'm, I'm going full on biblical? Because though he looks at our world today and grieves, he knows that there's men like you and I still here. Wondering, knowing, hey, instead of eight people, I got a whole world full of them. You see, because we're going to find out the population of righteousness was very small at this time. Very small. Enough to fit in a sedan car, enough to fit in a station wagon. But here in our world today, he looks and says, I have people everywhere. And what are they saying or doing or communicating about the grief that I see? It's a question for all of us, man. We all have to answer that. Not just me, but all of us. And what's very unfortunate is you'll find that sometimes the church today is doing, actually, not, not standing against it, but sometimes joining hands and forces with it. And <laughs> you've got to ask, what, what's grieving God now even further? That his own church would be doing things. His own people, his own, those that he has saved and called out to be from among them. Even them participating and joining in a holy matrimony with the world today. But then there's those 
Like verse 8. But Noah, he found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Well, there was a guy down there. <laughs> he found grace in the eyes of the Lord. See, I love knowing that the, that the eyes of the Lord search the world to and fro, looking, looking for those men, looking for the righteous, looking for those that he can say that is somebody who will stand. That is somebody who is doing everything they can in their lives to live righteously. That is somebody who is denying themselves, picking up their cross daily. I love knowing that God is still searching for men to stand in the gap, for people that are going to stand against unrighteousness. And then when he sees them, he's not going to go and, and hand them a sword and go, go, cut, go do business, cut heads. He's saying, I have found grace. See, those of us who are in this room who say, Lord, I, I don't want to agree with the wickedness of the world. He says, well, then you have found grace with me. You see, because it takes a powerful army of men, not with swords, but a powerful army of men that go forth preaching grace and mercy. Because it's the goodness of God that leads people to repentance, not the sword. And I don't mean the word as a sword, I mean literally. Sometimes we use the word like a sword to tell people they're wrong. <laughs> Cut them up, man. Make them bleed. And I'm down with that sometimes. But it's the goodness of God that leads people to repentance because it was God's goodness that led me to repentance. And still, it's God's goodness to me that keeps me in repentance because, oh, man, he could have cut me up a long time ago, even yesterday, even today. <laughs> so he found Noah. You see, and verse 9, these are the generations of Noah. Noah was a, a, a just man. You see that? Right off the top. Now, amongst this crowded world of sardine wickedness, there's a just man in there. Meaning, he made good decisions. He was fair in what he did. See, to be just is somebody who makes, makes a decision justly. Justice. You know, justice is served, man, that was a good decision. Someone who makes the right call in life and the things that they do. Are we men today walking just? And the decisions that we have that we're confronted with, things that are laid out before us on our, so to speak, table, are we making these decisions justly and rightly? Or are we flying off the handle? Because you know what? Flying off the handle is what all the others are doing. And making unfair decisions are what the rest of the world is doing. But not Noah. The rest of the world was making all the unfair decisions. And that's what's crazy is because today it is so easy to make an unfair decision. Why? Because it's selfish. But when you have to be just, sometimes it means you have to even deny yourself. But that was an attribute of Noah. So it says, and perfect in his generations. <laughs> perfect. My gosh, that's certainly not me. <laughs> but we got to ask ourselves... In our time today, what makes you and I perfect? Not our actions and our deeds, right? Christ makes us perfect. Standing in Jesus makes us perfect. Hiding ourselves curled up in a ball in the blood of the Lord, that's what makes us perfect. You see, someone who can make a right decision fairly and somebody who knows that I ain't got nothing to offer this world, but I got Jesus. And I know enough to know that the world behind me and the cross is before me. This is what God is looking for as he sought out and found Noah. Someone who's fair, not making foolish decisions, and someone who hides in the grace and the blood of his sacrifice and found perfect because of his sacrifice. Holy because he is holy. That's who he's looking for. So if you're a man in here who's like, you know, I feel, man, I thank God for that. Because I certainly, by my own deeds, cannot be perfect. But you know what? I know I'm hiding in the Lord every day, man. And I'm doing the best I can to make right decisions. Then guess what? You would be sit sitting next to Noah. And is God looking for you? Absolutely. Why? Because he says, just as the days of Noah, so shall it be in the, sons, in the Son of Man the day he returns. So he says, and Noah begot three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And I, I want to get into them later. And the, earth, the earth also was corrupt before God, as we heard, and the earth was filled with violence. Sound familiar? Violence everywhere you look. 
So not only is everybody unfair and everybody not perfect and doing whatever they want to do, there's violence everywhere, wickedness. Because what happens when you begin to just live off the only imaginations of your thoughts? Well, of course, violence. Because self protects itself by getting rid of other things, right? <laughs> Two people in a room, which one's going to stand? You get a sword, who's going to stay? And God looked upon the earth, verse 12, and beheld it was corrupt. It was corrupt. Remember, guys, just before all of this, about a thousand years and 67 days before this moment, the world was perfect. <laughs> perfect. Paradise. And about a thousand days and 67 days, a thousand and 67 days later, the world is corrupt because men begin to do whatever they wanted. Huge quantum leap of wickedness there, isn't it? What a shift in the, in, the, in the scene there. For all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. All flesh. Every single person out of the billions that were produced done nothing but wickedness at this time on the earth. Every single one of them. This unholy matrimony between things that weren't meant to be produced nothing but wickedness on the entire population. That's crazy. How does that even happen? You mean, you mean every single person was influenced and persuaded to join the wicked party? Yeah, everybody was. So far except for Noah. <laughs> what? How's that possible? Well, you know how that's possible? It's because God had a plan. He had a plan. And his plan certainly wasn't to just kill everybody and then go back to just being busy with stars and planets. Because he had recreated us. His plan was to continue to follow through with what he started. But it blows me away to think that the earth, you know, it's funny, just when men think that they can come up with a plan to bring peace, <laughs> or just when the earth or people of our earth or people of our nation or others we hear blabbing out the mouth, think they have found a way maybe to bring about peace. And they don't, they don't in that equation or formula add the name Jesus in it. Yeah, you could keep going, man. Keep on thinking, because it's not going to happen. So, now God said here, while he's looking down at this earth, of just filled with wickedness, and that the Bible clearly tells us that it was nothing but wickedness. And, oh, I want to back up for a second. Remember, every ruler here, remember it said these men of renown? These guys are calling shots. That, that's what it... That's why it says they were men, mighty men of renown. They were rulers. Some translations might even say they were rulers. These guys were ruling the earth. And notice, all they were doing was producing more wickedness and more wickedness and more wickedness. So it was strategic. It was a strategic attack against God's plan. This unholy matrimony. And what it did was now those who were in charge of the known population were only issuing forth orders that were going to produce more wickedness. Kind of like, when does it ever end? Wow. And God said unto Noah, and this is what's really, really neat about this scripture here, is that, you see, God found Noah, and as we know, he said he was perfect in all his ways, and God was pleased with him. God begins to share with him his plan. You see? His, God, in his mighty, you know, sitting on the throne, speaks to and is able, notice this, is able to speak to the one righteous man in the midst of all this. I like that. Because no matter how busy or no matter how loud the circumstance of the world is, he can still speak to us. Those who are listening, those whose minds and ears and hearts are set upon him, he can reach us in this madness that we're in, guys. He can because you start to go, man, God, what is, man, you start to look at the news and everything, you start to feel, how's God ever going to intervene in this? You know, he can intervene for those of us who are listening. So he says, and God said unto Noah, Noah, the end of all flesh is come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them. And, you know, that's important to note. I have that underlined and highlighted in that we see that the wickedness came through man, through the men of the earth. Ugh. And now he tells Noah his ultimate plan. Noah, since you have ears to hear what my spirit is saying to you down there, Noah, 
I will destroy them with the earth. Every single bit of it. It's gone. Now, if I was Noah, I'd be like, oh, okay, so what does that mean for me? Uh, Because, you know, I've been praying and stuff, and I've been living righteously and perfect and everything, and just, I'm a just man. Uh, You mean like, (laughs) we're all going to die. See, I believe now going back to looking at the Father's heart, the separation of releasing this world was still held together, you see, guys, held together with the promise that there's still an open door, there's still a possibility, there's still a rest, a comfort. You remember what Noah's name meant, guys, when we talked about it last week? His name means rest and comfort. You see, today we call the Holy Spirit our comforter. So he's really saying, I'm still going to, even though he said my spirit will not dwell with man, well, he's going to still leave a man whose name is Comfort, who we know today our Comforter is the Holy Spirit. He's still going to leave an avenue and a way to bring about restoration. Even though destruction is right at the door, there's still a way, a route, a possibility. See, I love that Noah's name is Comfort. <laughs> because the, Jesus said it. I'm going to leave a comforter behind, and he's going to remind you the things that I said. He's going to reveal unto you the things that he has taught us. And so we have the Holy Spirit today that in the time of his return, because we know, as we're going to get into the study next time, the ark, Noah's next project to build something the world has never seen, is a symbol of the cross of Jesus Christ and to hide within the Savior the protection during a time of destruction. And so when Jesus said, just as the days of Noah, so shall it be in these days that we live, you and I in, we need to look to the comforter. We need to find within the Holy Spirit our ears to hear what he is saying to us in these last days that we too would say, well, I don't have to build an ark. The ark's built. The ark is the cross. Jesus is that which we hide inside, and I still have my out here. And to be a part of God's plan. The takeaway in all of that, I think, well, there's a lot, but bottom line, our world today is wicked, man. It doesn't take a rocket science to know that. It doesn't take, you know, genius to figure out that we are living in similar times as Noah was. But what it does take is a man, though, like you and I, to say, well, then am I going to be as Noah was, too? That the possibility of a man to live such as Noah did, it extends to us, you and I, today in our decision making. Guys, don't veer to the left or to the right, but walk down that path that he set before every single one of us. It's in our daily decision making to say, I'm not going to be lukewarm. I'm not going to join hands with the world. I'm not going to have one foot in and one foot out type thing. What I want to do is I want to stand my ground, find my comfort in him, rest in the Spirit of God, rest in the sacrifice He provided, and in that, I'm going to stand perfect within this wicked world. But the only way we can do that is by our daily decision-making, guys. And joining the Lord in His grief, and grieving over this world that we see around us every day, and that we do have a part in it. There's something we can do. And so... I'm going to end there tonight because I, the whole building of the ark is a completely different topic and as far as just getting into it. But I think our prayers, brothers, for us tonight, <laughs> I think we get a little bit more insight on how we should be living in these days that, we, that are set before us. Amen? Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word, Lord, and thank you for just being that comfort for us, that rest as much as it's real difficult to find rest in these days, both physically and mentally, Lord, we know that you provide it for us. You desire that we would find rest in you. You said it, that there therefore remains a rest for the people of God. And so, Lord, as we see our world and the wickedness of it, we pray, Lord, that we would join in hurting for the world, hurting for the lost. Show us, Lord, how to, to just continue daily make decisions that aren't going to combine the world and, uh, or righteousness and unrighteousness, but help us, Lord, to live on that path that stays out of the way of sin. 
but we need your strength and your wisdom and power to do it. So fill us, Lord, tonight. Thank you, Lord, for tonight, for your word. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you guys.